This is John Rhodes, Chair of the Public Service Commission, and I call this session of the Public Service Commission to order. Secretary Phillips, are there any changes to the final agenda? Yes, Chair, there's one change to the final agenda. The Commission is going to be considering a resolution pertaining to the size of the Commission that will be considered after the regular agenda items and prior to considering the consent agenda. Thank you, um, uh, and that, um, that sequencing makes sense, so we'll let's do it that way. Um, before we get started, I would like to note our arrangement You're unmuted. today. In line with the guidelines concerning social distancing and You're minimizing muted. large gatherings, and in light of executive orders to suspend meeting provisions of the open meetings law on an emergency basis, we are conducting today's session remotely. I'd like to remind those who are participating by phone to please mute your lines except when you are speaking. The public will have the opportunity to listen to the session on the department's webcast page, and we will also record and transcribe the session as has been our practice. These arrangements have been reviewed by our general counsel, and he has found that these meet the requirements of the executive orders and also that they meet my own expectations of honoring the intent of the open meetings law to the maximum extent permitted by our duty to protect the public health of New Yorkers. Before moving to the agenda, I would like to conduct a roll call of the commissioners and a roll call in myself. Uh, I'm John Rhodes and I confirm that I'm here. Um, uh, Commissioner Diane Berman. Commissioner Berman, can you confirm you're with us? I am here. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner James Alisi. Yeah, can, can you hear me? I, I could hear you, Commissioner Berman, yes. Thank you. Commissioner James Alisi. Uh, um, Commissioner Tracy Edwards. I am here. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. And Commissioner John Howard? I am here, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you very much. And circling back to Commissioner Jim Alisi. Commissioner Alisi, you are on mute. I am Good here. Job. Excellent. Thank you. We are complete. Um, so let's proceed to the regular agenda, the discussion items, and to the first item for discussion, item 301, case 20B0197, which is the proceeding on a motion of the Commission to implement transmission planning pursuant to the Accelerated Renewable Energy Growth and Community Benefit Act presented by Elizabeth Grisaru, Deputy Director, Office of Electric, Gas, and Water. Tammy Mitchell, Director of Electric, Gas, and Water, um, and Bob Rosenthal, General Counsel, are available for questions. Liz, please begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Rhodes and Commissioners. I am pleased to present to you today the proposed draft order on the Phase 1 Local Transmission and Distribution Project proposals. The action taken here is an initial step to implementation of the grid planning directives contained in the Accelerated Renewable Energy Growth and Community Benefit Act, which Governor Cuomo signed into law in 2020. The Act directed the Commission to develop and implement plans for future investments in the electric grid that will support achievement of the state's climate goals as established in the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, or CLCPA. Before diving into the terms of the draft order, I will note for you and members of the interested public that staff expects to bring forward additional items related to those transmission planning mandates in the coming months. Last May, when it initiated this proceeding, the Commission directed the utilities to identify distribution and local transmission investments that will support CLCPA goals. In response, the utilities conducted a study that was filed last November in which they identified <clears throat> excuse me, a number of potential projects. The utility study shows, among other things, that traditional infrastructure investments driven by reliability, load growth, and asset maintenance needs 
can coincidentally capture significant CLC benefits, such as the delivery of renewable energy with an utility system. We refer to this category of investment as phase one process. The draft order before you focuses on the phase one category and provides direction to the utilities on the processes required to move forward with these investments. The draft order states that the preferred mechanism for review and approval of phase one projects is ordinarily the rate case process. Thus, where a phase one project is already funded in a utilities rate plan, the draft order directs the utilities to continue with project development. However, not all of the Phase I proposals submitted with the November filing are currently funded. Given the tight deadlines we have for meeting CLCPA goals, the draft order recognizes that an alternative funding mechanism may be necessary to ensure these projects are constructed in time. <clears throat> if a utility determines that a project will be needed sooner than can be achieved under its next rate case, the draft order authorizes the utility to file a petition seeking funding for that project. It also specifies the information that utilities will be required to submit in support of those petitions. As a threshold matter, the utility must make a showing as to why construction plans cannot be adjusted or reprioritized to fund the necessary Phase I projects. The order states the expectation that the petition mechanism will only be needed in the short term and that as utilities incorporate CLCPA objectives in their distribution and local planning processes, the rate case will ordinarily be the venue for consideration of these investments. <clears throat> the draft order adopts the utility's recommendation that costs for these phase one projects be recovered from the sponsoring utilities ratepayers as they would for other capital projects, as these investments are needed under traditional planning criteria without consideration of CLCPA requirements. Funding and cost allocation for, for facilities that are driven by CLCPA needs are issues staff expects to be addressed in future orders. There are two other planning-related directives given in this draft order that I should mention first. The draft order directs the utilities to review and report on the applicability of certain well-tested technologies to their Phase I investment proposals. These technologies have the potential to increase the CLCPA benefits associated with the projects. Second, the draft order directs staff to develop a straw proposal for a study methodology that will improve on the utility's approach to evaluating distribution and local transmission system capabilities. This will be used to inform future studies and the identification of needed projects. Staff will publish the proposal within three days for public comment and feedback. That concludes the summary of the draft order, and we are happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'll go first with my, with my reactions. Um, uh, in my eyes, this is a thoughtful um, and practical item um, founded on an open and thorough process with ample opportunity for input um, and, in fact, ample and helpful uh, uptake of that opportunity for input. Um, it represents the next milestone to developing out uh, the grid that we know we will need, uh, in today's case, focusing on the distribution and local transmission side of the grid. The steps that uh, we are taking today and the next steps that we are setting up with this item will enable smart projects that can support increased uh, renewables um, in a cost-effective and uh, useful manner while also uh, delivering on clear and present reliability needs. I am going to support this item. Um, let me now turn to my colleague commissioners for comments and questions. Uh, Commissioner Berman. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Commissioner Berman. I have no comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Alisi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I see that this uh, gives us uh, the, uh, the steps that need to be taken uh, to meet the mandates um, that require a reorientation of transmission and investment planning as we pursue the goals of the CLCPA, and I'll be supporting it. Uh, thank you very much. Commissioner Edwards. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Rhodes. I am in support of this 
this project as well. I think that, you know, anything that we can do to move forward on the CLCPA, we need to do that. Uh, so I think getting the phase one projects off the ground is necessary. Uh, I know that we will be working to try to provide as much information uh, as possible uh, to both who is going to be developing the projects as well as the public. So I think it's a good step for us to move forward, and I will be supporting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Commissioner Howard. Uh, I will be supporting this item, but I will comment that we are at the beginning of a, a very long trip. Um, this really does mark the change in how transmission planning moves from serving native load exclusively at the lowest cost uh, to a more environmentally sensitive and environmentally driven system. Uh, most of these, the items here on phase one, we're going to go forward regardless of the CLCPA in most instances. And we do get some tremendous benefits, uh, environmental benefits by their uh, construction. Um, I look forward to, in the very new future to see staff's uh, recommendations as we go forward, uh, which will quite honestly, that's where the real challenges lie, but I will be supporting this. Uh, thank you very much. Um, with that, uh, I think we're ready to proceed to vote on this item, and I will call for a vote. Um, for the record, it's John Rhodes, uh, and my own vote is in favor of the recommendation to establish processes for the utilities to develop phase one local transmission and distribution projects as discussed. Mr. Berman, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Alisi, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Edwards, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. And Commissioner Howard, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. The item is approved and the recommendation is adopted. Um, let's now move to the second item for discussion. Item 302, case 19P0684, Article 7 application of New York Transco construct the New York Energy Solution Project presented by Administrative Law Judge Anthony Delcido. Judge Delcido, please begin. Uh, good morning, Chair, and good morning, Commissioners. Uh, this proceeding involves an application submitted pursuant to Article 7 of the Public Service Law by Transco LLC for authorization to construct the New York Energy Solution Project, including the installation of a new 54.5-mile, 345-kV overhead electric transmission line to be co-located with reconfigured 115-kV transmission lines in an existing electric transmission corridor between a new 345-kV Niggerbacher switching station located in the town of Skodak, Rensselaer County, and the existing, existing 345-kV and 115 KV Pleasant Valley substations located in the town of Pleasant Valley, Dutchess County. The rebuild of the 150 KV Churchtown switching station in the town of Claverack, Columbia County, the replacement of 2.2 miles of 115 KV electric transmission line in an existing electric transmission quarter extending from the existing 115 KV Blue Store substation to a tap of the existing 115 KV Lafarge to Pleasant Valley line and the, the reconductoring of 0.8 miles of two 345 kV electric transmission line circuits on existing structures that will run between the existing Pleasant Valley substation and the new 345 kV Van Wagner capacitor bank station in the town of Pleasant Valley. The submission of the Article 7 application addressed by the draft order follows and results from the New York Independent System Operators or the NISO's public policy transmission planning process. That process was developed to comply with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC's Order Number 1000, which requires, among other things, a planning process for the consideration of transmission need driven by public policy requirements. This project, along with the one the Commission approved at its January session in Case 19-T-0549, and some other smaller upgrades constitute the AC transmission upgrades. The previous case involved Segment A, 
and this case involves segment B. Together, they will meet the public policy need for new 345 kV major electric transmission facilities to cross the Central East and up Mesini interfaces in order to move power from upstate to downstate. On October 18, 2019, the applicant, as the developer selected through the public policy planning process for segment B, submitted its Article 7 application for consideration in this proceeding. The application was determined complete as of February 10, 2020, and on April 14, 2020, the applicant filed a notice of impending settlement negotiations, notifying parties and interested persons that settlement negotiations would begin on May 4, 2020. Public statement hearings and information sessions were held virtually on October 14, 2020, and 12 public comments have been filed in this proceeding. All of them indicate support for the project. The New York League of Conservation Voters also submitted comments supporting the project, arguing that it advances the goals of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. On September 9, 2020, the applicant filed a joint proposal setting, settling the issues between the signatory parties, which include the applicant, staff the Department of Public Service, staff the Department of Environmental Conservation, and staff the Department of Agriculture and Markets, as well as Consol Consolidated Edison Company of New York Incorporated and the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Local Union Number 97. The joint proposal represents a comprehensive settlement that is sufficiently supported by a record that will allow the Commission to make all required findings. Article 7 required findings include, among others, the basis of the need for the facility, the nature of the probable impacts, and that the facility represents the minimum adverse environmental impact, considering the state of technology and the nature and economics of the various alternatives, and that the facility conforms to a long-range plan for expansion of the electric power grid of the state and interconnected systems. In this proceeding, Cricket Valley Energy Center, LLC, a natural gas fire generation plant located in Dutchess County, as well as a joint group of interveners consisting of the towns of Livingston, Milan, and Pleasant Valley, the farmers and families of Livingston, farmers and families of Claverack, and Walnut Grove Farm oppose the joint proposal, arguing that the project is not needed or that it does not represent the minimum adverse environmental impact. However, as described in detail in the draft order, the record in this case fully supports the finding that the facility is necessary to increase transmission capacity across the up Nisini interface, and that need is expected to continue as New York works towards the requirements of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act and the Accelerated Renewable Act. The record also demonstrates that by moving power efficiently and cost-effectively across the interface, the project will advance numerous public policies, including reducing congestion and production costs, improving market competition and liquidity, enhancing efficiency, reliability, and resiliency, and avoiding refurbishment costs of aging infrastructure. Further, the record clearly supports the required findings, including that the facility represents minimum adverse environmental impact, considering the state of technology and the nature of economics of the various alternatives, and that the facility conforms to a long-range plan for expansion of the electric power grid of the state. Therefore, the draft order recommends the commission grant to the applicant, pursuant to Public Service Law Article 7, Section 121, a conditional certificate of environmental compatibility and public need. Uh, that is the end of my presentation, and I'm happy to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Belsito. Um, my own uh, take is that this item um, uh, will approve a good application for a good and valuable project that is clearly in the public interest and that clearly meets a public policy need. It flows out of diligent, long-range, and systemic planning um, and out of a thorough and open and transparent process um, considering um, potential impacts and uh, the best way to uh, mitigate and balance those impacts, um, leading to a very sound uh, joint proposal. Um, this, to me, clearly meets the test of being in the public interest, and I will be supporting this item. Uh, Commissioner Berman. Thank you so much. Um, this is Commissioner Berman. Um, I just really have one question. Um, 
this item is not directly on point, but to the extent that we are talking about transmission and uh, for quarter 1,000, can you um, uh, give me a sense? Um, and this might also be directed to the chair of when we will see the re the resource adequacy white paper staff white paper as we're talking about transmission and all of that. This is really important. Um, so the, uh, let me. This is John Rhodes. Um, so the resource adequacy uh, white paper is well advanced um, and. Uh, uh, the work is good, so um, uh, I quote I, I Yogi Bear, and I don't like to make predictions, especially about the future, but my strong hope is that um, we'll be able to uh, finalize and issue it um, shortly. As in this week, next week, I'm just trying to get uh, in a month, uh, next uh, you Here... Uh, <laughs> I understand uh, uh, you, you'd like a more concrete answer. I, 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 as soon as we can, um, since you got specific, it won't be this week. Um, it will, as in, it won't. We won't be able to get to it tomorrow. But as, um, but other than that, in the near future, um, and, uh, and and I'm afraid I, I just can't. Um, I can't promise anything more precise than that. Thank you for that answer. Um, I have no further questions or comments. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Lisi? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, clearly, this serves the public need. Uh, I believe it's consistent with the long-term plans to improve reliability and uh, transmission capability, and uh, it will accommodate, help to accommodate uh, future expansion and uh, it's the result of hard work and transparency, and I will be supporting it. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Edwards? I will be supporting this item. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Howard? Uh, I also will be supporting this item, uh, quite honestly, enthusiastically. Uh, and this and, uh, and the previous project that we have approved, I look I look forward to seeing steel on the ground in the next coming months. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we are in a position to proceed to vote, and I will therefore call for a vote. Uh, for the record, it's John Rhodes speaking, and my own vote is in favor of the recommendation to adopt the terms of the joint proposal as discussed. Commissioner Berman, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Lisi, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you. Commissioner Edwards, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you. Commissioner Howard, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. The item is approved and the recommendation is adopted. We will now proceed to the third item for discussion, which is an informational non-voting item. It is item 501, case 21 m 0042, as it relates to the staff's investigation of the impact of Tropical Storm Isa Eos on telephone and cable television services presented by Michael Rowley, Chief Network Reliability. Nicholas Forst, Assistant Counsel, Deborah LaBelle, Director, Office of Telecommunications, Joseph Such, Director, Office of Investigations and Enforcement, Kevin Wisely, Director of Office of Resiliency and Emergency Preparedness, and Brian Asias, a managing attorney are available for questions. Mike, please begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Rhodes and Commissioners. In this information-only item, staff presents to the Commission its report on Tropical Storm ICES's impact on telephone and cable networks and services. The report provides a summary of the preparation and restoration efforts of the service providers in areas impacted by the storm, including Verizon, New York, Frontier Communications, Charter Communications, Comcast Communications, and Altice USA. It also includes input from municipal leaders, emergency response agencies, and customers. The report also provides background and evidentiary support for alleged violations by Altice and Frontier that have been identified and forwarded to the Department's Office of Investigations 
and enforcement for next steps. As you are aware, Governor Andrew Cuomo directed the department to conduct an investigation into New York State's major electric utilities, telephone corporations, and cable television companies following the, their slow and inadequate response to Tropical Storm Isaias. The standards for measuring telephone company preparation and restoration performance following a storm or emergency are provided in Part 603.5 of the Commission's regulations, which has three components. These regulations require providers to, one, construct and maintain networks which are intended to minimize service failures due to severe storms and maintain continuous operation of its service in the event of a commercial power loss. Two, maintain emergency contingency plans to prepare for emergencies, perform repairs, and service restorals in the aftermath of such events. And three, report major service interruptions to the department pursuant to established outage reporting guidelines. Existing commission regulations do not have specific emergency contingency plan or outage reporting requirements for cable television companies, but the commission has significant legal authority to investigate and ensure that cable television companies provide services in a safe, adequate, and reliable manner, including during storms and other outage events. The major cable companies in New York, Altice, Charter, and Comcast do provide outage reports per established guidelines during storms. Additionally, as part of the, eight, the Altice Cablevision merger order in 2016, Altice was directed to file and update annually an emergency response and readiness plan, which Altice calls its Resiliency Plan, or RP. The Altice RP also includes a detailed and comprehensive Severe Weather Preparedness Plan, or SWPP. In addition to our observations and active storm restoration monitoring, the department's investigation included the review of thousands of pages of documents and emails, interviews with telephone and cable television employees, including key personnel with storm response duties, meetings with municipal stakeholders and emergency response agencies, and the review of customer complaints. The result of staff's investigation identified apparent violations in the preparation and restoration operations of two providers, Altice and Frontier. As to Altice, the department's investigation revealed that Altice failed to adhere to many significant aspects of its RP and SWPP. A few days following the storm, the department began to feel numerous inquiries from county and local elected officials who reported they could not easily reach Altice representatives and that when they were successful, Altice could not provide accurate outage and restoration information for its service areas particularly municipalities in its Westchester, Nassau, and Suffolk County territories. Officials reported being overwhelmed by the level of constituent complaints received when subscribers couldn't reach Altice, and this continued in many areas for several days after commercial power had been restored. As a result of these inquiries, the department arranged daily conference calls with municipal and Altice government affairs personnel in the Westchester and Long Island counties. During these meetings, Altice acknowledged several pro problems it experienced with its restoration, including the failure of its interactive voice response or IVR system and its website that prevented customers from being able to lodge service requests and ascertain accurate information regarding the status of their services. These failures occurred at a critical stage just after Tropical Storm Isaias had passed through New York. Additionally, Altice could not initially provide the department or the municipal officials with estimated time, estimated restoration times for the thousands of remaining customer outages and only did so late in the restoration process. Altice also admitted it did not conduct sufficient outreach to county emergency management offices or local government officials at the onset of its restoration efforts, which could have resulted in a more coordinated restoration with electric utilities enhanced damage, damage assessment strategy, and a more timely restoration of, sober, of services overall. The daily conference calls also included lengthy discussion about service credits for customers experiencing outage, which Altice committed to issue proactively, stating that customers in most circumstances would not have to call to request credits. 
Subsequently, the department issued a notice of apparent violation or NOAV on August 19th, 2020, alleging numerous violations of its RP and SWPP that contributed to Altice's inability to timely restore service and effectively communicate to customers experiencing outages. Because we were still in storm season, the NOAV also demanded that Altice implement remedial action items to immediately improve restoration policies and operations and prevent any delayed restoration from potential storms. In response, Altice, among other things, committed to several actions, including upgrading and revising its RP and SWPP to address the needs for additional crews and equipment, developing plans to actively participate with municipal and county OEM emergency response and restoration activities, developing a revised plan to deploy and monitor power supplies, generators, and backup generators adequate for use during emergency and storm restorations, a commitment to better identify government contacts in affected areas, establishing a process to provide timely and accurate information to customers, the media, and government groups, establishing a process to provide timely and accurate outage information, including estimated times of restoration for each municipality, and establishing a process to coordinate periodic updates to its customer websites. The department continues to monitor the commitments Altice has made to improve its storm readiness and response. And as, and as mentioned, resolution of the apparent NOV, NOAV violations are being addressed by the department for next steps. The department's investigation also found Frontier an apparent violation of several regulations regarding the failure to provide continuous operation of its service during the loss of commercial power at a critical central office, as well as apparent failures to timely and accurately notify the department of major outages following the storm, including that which affected the 911 network in Orange County. The loss of power at a central office was due to what staff found to be an avoidable equipment failure and apparently defective or improperly loaded batteries and improper alarming of the power system, which contributed to an inadequate response this caused, the, this caused the loss of dial tone to over 5,800 individual customers, businesses, and government agencies served by the central office switch, including the Orange County 911 Center or Public Safety Answering Point. Orange County 911 handles emergency 911 calls from all telephone access lines in Orange County, as well as wireless 911 calls made within the county. Orange County did not become aware of the loss of the central office until after it occurred, and thus could not make contingency arrangements to notify citizens of alternative, alternative methods to reach emergency 911 responders during the severe weather emergency. In the course of its investigation, staff found four other major outages following the storm that Frontier failed to report to the department for established outage reporting guidelines required in our regulations. Frontier has also taken steps to re remediate the problems that led to the central office shutdown, including upgrades to its power systems and contingencies, training, and improving the ability to reroute 911 traffic should critical switches become inoperable. Staff will continue to monitor the commitments Frontier has or will make to improve its central office power systems and contingencies. As mentioned, the parent violations have been identified in the department for future resolution. Staff's investigation did not find any apparent violations of specific regulations by Verizon or other service providers in its restoration following Tropical Storm ICES. With regard to the readiness and restoration of telephone and cable television networks in general, some customers and elected officials were dissatisfied with the performance of providers and raised concerns regarding the timeliness of repair to outages, unclear credit policies, the lack of coordination and communication with municipal officials, and the lack of coordinating restoration efforts with the electric utilities. Many of the problems and concerns raised by customers and elected officials in the areas most affected by tropical storm ICES, including those raised by United Westchester, were the same problems observed by staff. So to address these shortcomings, staff suggests the commission pursue changes to regulations that would require the filing and annual updating of more robust emergency contingency plans, similar
similar to those required of the electric utilities. These changes would require that companies conduct annual storm drills to test the adequacy and effectiveness of storm preparedness and response policies and personnel, including contacts with outside, outside agencies, local governments, and others who would normally be included in service restoration response. Customer support systems would also be tested. Companies would be required to conduct annual testing of critical power systems and contingencies. Among other things, the enhanced emergency response plans would require companies to develop emergency classifications to better predict the type of expected damage estimated at the time and the time required to restore service to business as usual levels. And an indication of whether company personnel alone or company and supplementary personnel would be needed to repair system damage. Companies would also be required to develop service restoration procedures and an emergency response training program for those personnel assigned service restoration responsibilities. Cable television and telephone companies would be required to state how they will coordinate with electric utilities and local county governments as part of their emergency plan and develop improved ways to communicate with customers during storms. Companies would also declare what corporate policy and criteria govern, governs conditions under which requests for mutual aid from other service providers and contractors would be taken. Staff also supports exploring revised regulations for telephone and cable television service to provide credits to sub subscribers when it is not available to customers following outages caused by storms and power outages. This change would, br would bring cable credit regulations more in line with what is available to electric and certain telephone customers when service is not available due to storms and power outages. Staff believes that these new regulations will hold telephone and cable television companies more accountable for their respective storm preparedness, staffing for efficient restoration, adequate communication and coordination with emergency agencies and municipalities, the issuance of credits for storm outages, and make violations of these provisions more enforceable. That concludes my presentation, and we will gladly address any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Um, uh, this is John Rhodes, um, and, I, and I note again that this is an informational item uh, and a non-voting item. Um, so, um, but we, we uh, uh, but we do want to. Uh, create the opportunity for commissioners to react to and comment on and ask questions. Um, so my own reaction is that I appreciate uh, the thorough report uh, laying out the findings of this rigor rigorous investigation into service failures related to restoration and credits and communications, a really familiar set of failures uh, by telecom providers uh, during and after the tropical after tropical storm Isaias, and the effects of those failures on customers and on local governments. Um, uh, obviously, uh, this storm and these failures um, occurred while we were in the grips, as we still are, of the COVID crisis, and thus at a time when our fellow New Yorkers were especially developed, dependent on communication services. Um, and therefore, uh, in a situation and at a time when uh, these failures were especially uh, consequential. Um, I also note that the investigation um, appropriately found varying levels of performance uh, by, the different, by the different companies. Um, I find uh, the, the next steps um, that, uh, this, that, that Mike Rowley's presentation describes to be on the mark. Um, and I find the recommendations to um, flow responsibly uh, from the issues identified and the gaps identified um, in the report. Um, and I look forward to the next steps on those recommendations, namely input from the public and various other modes of consideration of the recommendations um, as, um, as this thing, uh, as, as this topic finds its way um, towards the commission for um, you know, ultimate order. So um, I commend uh, the, uh, the strong team's strong work um, on this item. Uh, thanks very much for that.
Uh, now I turn to my other colleague commissioners, uh, Commissioner Berman. Thank you so much. This is uh, Commissioner Berman. Um, I will be fairly brief. Um, one question, uh, I have several questions, but one question I have um, for um, Mr. Raleigh is, you stated that apparent violations of the commission regulations have been identified to the Department's Office of Investigations and Enforcement for next steps. What are those next steps? Um, who will be involved in those decisions? And when will the commission be um, engaged in that? Commissioner Berman, this is Joseph Such uh, from the Office of Enforcement. Perhaps I would, you, you would allow me to, to address some of those comments Great. and then Mike Thank can you. comment. Th thank you. Uh, uh, it's correct that this investigation, which I see as quite comprehensive to the telecom and, and telephone industries, uh, did not identify violations across the board with every, with every um, utility we looked at. Uh, there were, as noted, there were two uh, telecommunications companies and cable companies, Altice USA and Frontier. Uh, they both have approached the department uh, in terms of settlement. The department, my office, is in confidential settlement agreements with those two entities right now. I'm not allowed, as you know under our rules to discuss any details of those settlement um, agreements as they're currently pending. So I will not under these under this public forum or under any other circumstances. However, should a potential settlement be reached between the department and these entities, this would be brought to the commission as with all our uh, potential settlements for your consideration and potential approval. Um, you mentioned that you're in settlement negotiations. Has a uh, formal settlement negotiation notice been um, uh, uh, put forward um, pursuant to our settlement regulations guidelines? Uh, yes, the the parties have submitted to us a uh, the confidential information under section three point nine. Notice? What's what's uh, it's not noticed, uh, Commissioner, in that it's a proceeding has not yet been commenced as to this um, as to this uh, uh, as to this uh, action. Um, so, since there is not yet an order to show cause, uh, we are, are treating it as confidential settlement negotiations. But it doesn't precisely fit under Section three point nine, which which uh, is triggered through a proceeding. All right, I am a little concerned about that process. Um, as I've stated before, um, I think that we do need to lean in uh, as a commission uh, with staff on uh, our uh, um, processes, regards to uh, investigations, orders, show causes, and settlement negotiations, and then ultimately what the proper um, uh, focus should be and what the prudent um, substantive analysis uh, and resolution um, would look like, as well as making sure that stakeholders feel that there is um, a fair uh, certain regulatory structure that's in place um, and that we are treating uh, all um, uh, stakeholders in the same way and not picking and choosing. Um, so it is something that I, I um, you know, would like to further discuss. I think it's really important uh, to our critical um, uh, role here. Um, but thank you. And my comments from other sessions on this matter um, really are uh, part and parcel. I do think it is odd that it's a information only item, especially as the commission, as the staff, um, as uh, Mr. Rowley. Um, stated is suggesting that the commission pursue changes to regulations that would require the filing and annual updating of what they perceive as more robust emergency contingency plans. Um, to the extent that they are currently uh, working with us uh, and coordinating uh, in their emergency response, and there are several uh, regulations and requirements that are um, important for them to follow, 
to the extent that they are um, putting forth documents um, and emergency plans, the telcos, who is reviewing them? Is um, uh, who is reviewing them? Um, where is the analysis on where they can improve, uh, and how does that process work um, with the telecommunications staff working with the uh, folks who are involved in the storm management? I'm not sorry. Sure. <laughs> um, companies are required to file um, emergency yep. response plans, and and we do you know look at them um, routinely, and and certainly following a, 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 a major storm, uh, we also um, expect um, and and them to be preparing for storms, uh, and we do communicate with the telecommunications companies prior to a storm, um, but. You know, as we know in our regulations, they're, they're not uniform um, between telephone and cable providers. Um, so there are, you know, these companies uh, respond to storms differently, I, I, I believe, because of that. Um, and, you know, we're, we're trying to, to create a more uniform approach to how we evaluate, um, um, you know, the company's performance, um, you know, after their restoration uh, or, or, or during and after their restoration. And it's, you know, I think it's difficult for us to do that when um, we also have, you know, stronger, um, you know, we know what the electric companies do for their restorations. Uh, you know, we think that is, uh, you know, an effective way to monitor uh, and evaluate performance uh, following a storm. And it, it just, you know, we just don't have those same um, standards uh, when we when we evaluate telephone cable operations. So that's why, you know, that's the uh, really the, the gist of the of the recommendations. Thank you. I don't fully understand exactly what you're um, saying because it doesn't necessarily translate to all that I've been told as a commissioner um, since I've been here, uh, um, since Superstorm Sandy and focusing on all of the uh, regulatory oversight that telecom folks were doing and working with emergency response. So it is something of a disconnect to me. We recently had a opportunity for our five-year review of regulations to have staff recommend any regulations that they thought were in need of being changed. Um, I can't imagine that after one storm with only two telcos that you're currently in settlement negotiations with, that changing the whole structure of the regulatory process um, would be done um, and not necessarily first thought through in terms of coming to the commission with, um, you know, uh, something for us to vote on uh, that would be appropriate or not. Um, so I just uh, have a difficult time fully understanding exactly, um, you know, what you think that the uh, regulations being updated would do, because as I say it for right now, they are reporting a number of things. We are engaged with them, and we um, have always been assured that uh, the telecom folks um, were working with the uh, electric folks in ensuring and storm management in ensuring that we were working through any challenges. Um, so I, I'm just, I'll leave it at that. I look forward to engaging further on this, um, but I think it is something we need to really seriously consider. Um, and also to the extent that if there are changes that um, staff feel would be helpful to their um, management oversight role, that they share that, um, uh, you know, with the commissioners internally as well and work through that um, and lean into um, our substantive engagement on these issues because we all care about it. So thank you so much. I have no further questions. I am sorry this isn't um, more fleshed out as a item for voting on. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Lisi. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is good work, um, very in-depth, and uh, the report it clearly underscores the need uh, for improved 
uh, pre-storm planning and better, quicker restoration of service. Um, almost too obvious to state, but uh, it provides us also with an opportunity to revise our own regulations and perhaps with regard to things like credits for service interruption, et cetera. But most importantly, I think it should be clear that uh, communication, improved communication, is the key to avoiding the failures that we have seen uh, and that are noted in this report. Um, as I said before, it, it is good in-depth work, and uh, we can use this as a significant tool uh, as we move forward in improving the landscape uh, in predicting uh, failures and to dealing with them quickly when they occur. I'll be voting yes. Oh, I'm not voting. <laughs> You're not hey. voting, no. <laughs> um. <laughs> I'd be voting yes uh, anyway. <laughs> um, well, let's just move along to uh, Commissioner Howard. I think I'm next. I defer to uh, sorry, Commissioner uh, Edwards. I, I meant, yes, Commissioner Edwards, I think I, you are next, Tracy, and I, miss, and I misspoke. I'm very sorry. Yes. That's okay. No, not not a problem. Okay. You know, I, I really want to... Um, I want to thank the team for this update, you know, and I understand that it is an update. You know, um, you know, residents are very reasonable during storms and during service outages. You know, we all work very hard to prepare for storms, especially since the storms have changed over time. And we also understand how companies have to ensure the safety of their employees is a priority. But what we can never tolerate is a lack of communication. And changing the restoral times without communicating to the residents or to the municipalities that are also out there trying to coordinate their storm teams. You know, developing and submitting emergency contingency plans is not a paper exercise. We expect them to work when implemented. So I really want to thank the investigation team for working with speed on providing this update to identify these failures. And, you know, you have also identified items that we we can do better too, and we should do that. So I want to thank you for work expertly and cooperation uh, with all of us to to get this right. This needs to be corrected so that we get this. So I want to thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now, uh, and now, Commissioner Howard. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I give uh, staff uh, a great deal of credit for what they produced uh, and identifying issues and uh, potential remedies and holding systems account. However, the failure that New Yorkers and quite honestly all Americans need to understand that the regulation of data services, and, and I think in this case that is the most critical part of what uh, people miss here, data, Internet services, and particularly as we move into the Internet of Things, that states and this state commission, as all state commissions have, have limited, very limited regulatory oversight on the issue of data provisions. I would urge, and I think uh, we were able to meet with our national colleagues in the last few days virtually, uh, it is very clear that the issue of treating data services as a utility service that is absolutely necessary with the same regulations that we provide for energy uh, utilities at the state level is absolutely necessary. And 
I commend staff for using every trick or pardon me tool in their book, including making sure that uh, companies live up to uh, agreements they met with uh, made with this commission. However, until we are able to have a fully integrated regulatory oversight of data services, we will be continuing to do the best we can under the circumstances, but not the best that can be done. Uh, again, I look forward to uh, everybody's uh, further work on this. But again, to our representatives in Washington, please give this commission the authority to fully regulate data services. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so that concludes our consideration of this item um, for this session. Um, we will now move to um, the resolution um, that uh, Secretary Phillips notified us was um, additional item. Um, will you be, will Bob Rosenthal, will you be presenting this item or? Yes, I will, Chair. We look to? Thank I you am much. prepared. And so I will pre uh, prepare the present, provide the presentation. Um, you know, Tom Congdon, myself, Michelle. Uh, Phillips will be prepared to you know, provide any answers to questions that the committee may have. So with that stated, um, thank you and good morning, uh, Chair Rhodes and Commissioners. Um, let me provide some background pursuant to Public Service Law Section 4, Subdivision 2. The Commission has authority to request that the Governor increase the size of the Commission from five members to seven members if it certifies there is a need to do so. Under the operative language of the statute, quote, whenever the commission shall certify to the governor that additional commissioners are needed for the proper disposition of the business before it, the governor may increase the membership of the commission to seven members by appointing two additional commissioners by and with the consent of the Senate. One additional point. The term of any added commissioner is the same as the existing commissioner, six years from, from the February of the calendar year in which the commissioner is appointed. With respect to the uh, resolution before you, um, that's a resolution that certifies the need to expand the commission as envisioned by section four, subdivision two of the public service law. So there are numerous examples of new initiatives and statutory requirements that have been added to the Commission's docket in recent years that justify this expansion. And let me name a few. First is the transformation of the retail electric industry to provide New York customers with cleaner, more renewable, resilient, reliable, and affordable electric service. Second is establishing and refining a statewide program to make energy more affordable for low-income consumers. Third is adopting and refining the clean energy standard. And then there are many other examples, like implementing the statutory requirements of the CLTPA by aligning the clean energy standard with the 70 by 30 target and the zero emissions by 2040 target, the requirement to procure at least nine gigawatts of wind as well as the procurement targets related to solar and battery storage. The Commission otherwise has been promoting clean and renewable energy resources through community net metering, the VITA rate, New Efficiency New York, and the Easy Make Ready program. It's been securing benefits for New York customers as conditions to major telecommunication company mergers. It's been strengthening natural gas safety through enforcement actions and championing water conservation alternatives. The PSC has also been tasked with expanded regulatory work over the last few years, including an increase in the number of Article 7 cases due to the need to address existing transmission constraints, and we've heard a few of those over the last few weeks and months, and additional cases that will be filed um, as noted in Ms. Gazzara's presentation to address the utility transmission planning and investments required by the Accelerated Renewable Energy Growth and Community Benefit Act of 2020. 
there's expanding there's a need for expanding access to broadband is more critical and difficult to the, to the enduring and devastating toll brought by the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to promote improved preparation, planning, and resilience by regulated utilities due to more frequent instances of severe weather from climate change. The PSC has also commenced a greater number of enforcement actions against utilities, and as a result, has a significant number of open litigated proceedings currently underway. All of this, of course, is in addition to the core work we do with respect to rate cases, management and operation audits, and consumer protection. In sum, given these broad responsibilities, there is a need for additional perspectives and assistance to ensure that all of the issues now confronting the Commission are given deep consideration and properly balanced by competing points of view. Additionally, given the changing composition of the Commission that will already be occurring with Chair Rhodes' departure, it seems that now is the right time to articulate the need to expand the membership of the Commission to the Governor as required under Section 4 of the Public Service Law as well as to the legislature and the general public. And that ends my remarks, and as noted, um, several of us are available for any questions that you may want. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, so um, we'll, um, we'll proceed through our now familiar, um, even though I got it wrong uh, the last time, uh, order of commissioner comments and questions. Uh, I'll, I'll begin with myself. It's John Rhodes. Um, I find that um, this is um, uh, fundamentally a straightforward matter. Uh, if there's a need, um, it's uh, proper and, in fact, almost necessary uh, for the Commission to um, acknowledge that need um, and advance a proposal um, like this to the governor. Um, and I do believe uh, the need itself is clear cut. Um, uh, Bob, you've, you, Bob has um, outlined uh, a number of areas in which um, <clears throat> the workload on the commission and on the staff has been increasing over the years. Um, this is a good thing because we're doing good work for New Yorkers, uh, but we have to understand what it means in terms of uh, capacity. We talked about REV, we talked about CC, CPA, Clean Energy Standard, Article 7, storms, enforcement action related to storms and beyond Indian Point, um, or affordability, especially in the context of COVID. Um, the, list, the list is well known. Um, I, uh, I'm going to be, I am in favor um, of this of this resolution. Um, with that, let me turn it over to my colleague commissioners, uh, beginning with uh, Commissioner Berman. Thank you so much. Um, this isn't the first time that a commission has utilized the public service law section, uh, Article 4, Section 2, to certify to a governor that additional commissioners are needed for the proper disposition of the position business before it. Um, it was done in January 1975 um, unanimously by Alfred Kahn, who was then the chairman um, under Governor Carey. Um, Alfred Kahn did it uh, after uh, uh, Governor Carey publicly stated that he would like to see the commission increase. Um, for those of you um, who follow some of the historical underpinnings of the commission, there was also significant tension between Governor Carey um, and Alfred Kahn. Um, Governor Carey did, uh, after the commission unanimously uh, um, um, con uh, confirmed the certification and sent it to him, Governor Carey did take up that um, certification recommendation and did appoint um, in 1976, shortly thereafter, the two commissioners. He also, um, shortly thereafter, uh, removed Alfred Kahn as the sitting 
chairman. Alfred Kahn, much to the consternation of the governor at the time, remained on uh, as a commissioner, um, even though he uh, had been um, uh, removed as as um, as chair. In 1991, and so the commission remained at um, seven uh, members um, until 1991 when Mario Como um, did not um, uh, have uh, continue and the terms of office for the folks um, were removed and they were not filled, um, the two. So the two that are that become on or sit in those terms and only if um, there's a decision to continue and recertify while they remain. Mario Cuomo, in his 1991 budget address, um, actually proposed the uh, reduction in membership of about 20 independent boards and commissions, an elimination of compensation for members and chairpersons, and 56 boards and commissions. Um, during that same year, he also proposed the merger of the State Energy Office, the Energy Research and Development Authority, and the Low Income Weatherization Program of the Department of State into then the newly constituted State Energy Authority. That merger was seen um, as can, can those who are not who are not speaking mute themselves. Thank you. The merger was to achieve economies in management and administration. It was seen as helping to improve program coordination and um, be a cost saver. In 2011, Governor Andrew Cuomo also established the Spending and Government Efficiency Commission, uh, commonly known as SAGE, which was to mark the beginning of a full-scale effort to modernize and right-size New York State government. SAGE was responsible for coming up with ways to streamline every state agency, recommending structural and operational changes to make government perform better and at a lower cost. They did complete their work and released a final report in February 2013. The goals of SAGE, um, as articulated by SAGE um, and the governor, were to reorganize state government, reduce costs and improve service, and build a culture of performance and accountability. Um, in fact, during that same time frame, the old Consumer Protection Board was merged into the um, uh, Department of State and is now known as um, UIU. Can those who are not on um, speaking, can they please mute themselves? There is some background noise. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I guess the question becomes, and um, uh, Council Rosenthal, I do appreciate that you uh, answered the question, why now? Um, when you spoke, it was because you've seen this time is right. We have um, uh, two commissioners whose uh, terms uh, have been up since February 1st. One commissioner is uh, uh, leaving, um, at least as of now, and we have now, we will go down to um, four commissioners, uh, uh, potentially three. And so when we look at this, um, it may seem like the appropriate time. I put that, though. It isn't the appropriate time because we actually don't know who the governor will pick as his interim and or permanent chair. For me, when I look at that, it's important for us to take full stock of what we are doing as a commission and what we are doing with DPS, which is the agency um, that uh, is a part of the commission um, and is our staff arm. I asked, I'm only finding out yesterday um, for a number of things. What concerns me is that it is the first time I've ever been told that this is something that was being looked at or interested in. Um, I don't think it's appropriate for the chair who is leading to weigh in on what the balance of the membership should be after he is leaving. It is for us as commissioners working with our staff to determine what we think are the needs and whether or not it's proper for us to say, 
that we really do need to certify to the governor that additional commissioners are needed. We don't know what the one or two commissioners that may come and who will be chair um, will bring with them, what their expertise will be, what their technical capabilities will be, and what their understanding is of the workings of the commission and the staff. Therefore, I think it's really appropriate for us to wait until those, com- those uh, spots are filled um, or uh, um, reappointed. And in that case, we can have as a commission um, together a uh, robust discussion um, and work with our staff on what the needs are and whether or not we think that additional commissioners are necessary. With additional commissioners, we really have to look at what we're currently doing to be able to do that. A couple of things that I asked for yesterday um, when I realized that this was going to be on session um, was, one, the commission resolution that was done the last time um, back in 1975 um, and any internal documents um, on that matter that would help to show the analysis that was Uh, that was engaged in. I was told it could not be found. I feel that that's very um, disconcerting to me that historical documents um, on something as important as the makeup of the commission and for us to have come before us at the last hour would be something that wouldn't have been looked to in terms of uh, the appropriateness and uh, comparison. We have an item uh, on the uh, agenda that's a consent agenda. It's a water item that refers back to the 2008 order, uh, and we make some decisions based on that 2008 order. I think it's really important for us to have the historical perspective, historical understanding, and also to see how it was done from a process perspective to make sure that what we do is deliberative and that we're getting it right. The other thing I asked for was the press release or statement, which was around 1991 or 92, when Mario Cuomo declined to continue the commission at the seven number. It's very important for me to understand why there was the going from seven to five. Some of the very same reasons that it went up to seven um, we're saying now, but then it went back down to five, um, and I want to understand that more. I also asked about what the current staffing levels Um, are. Um, I was told that it's about 473. Um, For me, I see this as something that we really need to address our own staffing levels and whether we have the appropriate resources, and that includes our staff, um, and making sure that uh, they um, will be able to handle an additional two commissioners. I think we're understaffed currently, and that does concern me. It does not mean that I'm advocating for more staff. I understand our budgetary constraints. I understand that that's something that the legislature will be working through with the governor, and um, I accept whatever they say. However, I am really concerned. Um, One of the other questions I asked was the number of staff that have left the agency, whether through retirement, leaving for a new job, or other matters since 2014 and what year each left. Um, I was told that that wasn't able to um, be given to me uh, before the session. I did do um, a quick search on our uh, state telephone directory, um, and I know it's not uh, potentially uh, as accurate as it could be, but it indicated, at least based on the data that was there, that um, in the year 2020, 45 staff members have left our agency. Um, I think that's a lot. Uh, I don't know um, if that's something that uh, is uh, historically um, seen each year. I'd like to understand that. I'd like to understand the breakup of that. I asked also about the number of staff expected to leave now through 2021 and 2022, um, for those who have indicated they are leaving um, or will be leaving and getting ready for some transition um, uh, with that. I asked about the number of staff eligible or will be eligible to retire from between now and 2025. We need to make sure that if we're looking to increase the size of commission, that um, when staff leaves, if they're not going to be, um, if we're not going to be able to hire, 
that we're able to uh, work with the with that number, and that the staff is um, uh, able to have the resources they need, and more staff might be necessary. I asked about the number of staff hired when we were given monies in the budget uh, prior to hire for Article um, 10. I asked about the number of staff leaving or expected to leave to staff the new siting office. I do understand one staffer has currently left um, and that more may be coming. I asked for a list of all the outside consultants that even if paid through another agency or state funding or working with us on state energy environmental proceedings, um, I would like a list of those, what they are doing, and how much their contract is for, and where the funding is coming from. Um, we may be able to look at a uh, reduction in the need for outside consultants and also look at um, uh, um, what that means for the ability to have more staff or not. Um, we also looked at, I asked for the number of DPS staff and outside consultants um, that are engaged with the Climate Action Council. We have several staff members who are formally engaged, um, as well as uh, the chair who is working with that. Um, I also asked um, about the budget hearing and the discussion that was uh, asked to Chair Rhodes related to the staffing levels. Um, and the difference between the current staffing levels and requested amount. Um, the budget indicates uh, a staffing of 476, I believe, um, or 473. One way, it's either one of the two. It's either we have about 473 staffers, and I think the budget indicates uh, four, 476. Um, the issue for me is we do understand that there will be no backfilling. Um, we also, for me, is this coming out of left field concerns me. It could have been something that was discussed um, at the budget hearing. And so I guess the question I really have is one to why the rush? What's the upside of doing that? Is there a downside by waiting? Now, as I see it, the upside by waiting is that we can wait for the chair um, to be um, nominated and uh, appointed or a new commissioner, um, and then the governor picking who would be the chair. And then we can have a discussion on what is appropriate or not. If we move forward with this and the governor acts on it in the same um, session cycle, what happens is that you would now have four commissioners with a current term of six years expiring at the same time. That means when we go, when we fast forward, six years, we would lose potentially or have to deal with holdover status and or um, potential worrying about reappointments. We could potentially lose four key commissioners out of the seven at the same time. We already have three three commissioners whose terms expire at the same time. That knowledge base leaving could be very um, impactful. So it doesn't, for me, seem like it's a rush for us to fill uh, or to certify that we should have uh, additional commissioners when we haven't done our own homework and analysis on what we may need and what the staff may need to be able to work. Some of the things that we should be looking at we should be determining whether the department's organizational structure is best suited to meet cha our changing regulatory responsibilities. We should be determining whether existing staff resources are adequate and properly allocated to the department's tasks and responsibilities. We should be evaluating whether our processes and management me methods optimize the efficiency and effectiveness of staff, and we should be evaluating whether processes and management methods optimize working with the commission and what the proper role of the commission is internally. Um, I've, been a, I've been at the commission both as a staffer and as a commissioner. I have worked either as a staffer or when I was a commissioner in total with seven different chairs, whether in interim status or not. I can tell you that it is really, really important that we have an engaged and committed commission 
working with the staff. But it's hard work, and just because there's a lot of substantive hard work that needs to get done, adding two commissioners doesn't necessarily make it easier or better. Having us as a body working together seamlessly, even if we feel we're, um, uh, you know, have fewer members, is something that's really, really important. So I'm going to be voting no on this. I would really um, ask folks to think carefully about this because I don't think this is necessarily the appropriate time to do this, and I think we need to still do a lot more homework of what it is that we as a commission need and what we, working with the department, need um, from the department. So I'm going to be voting no. Um, I really feel um, uh, concerned by this. Um, and I'm not quite sure where this came from. Uh, it's uh, out of left field for me, just having gotten this uh, yesterday, and so I, I am concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Um, Mr. Alisi, uh, any comments or questions? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm going to support this. Um, I'm very impressed with the professionalism and hard work of, of the staff, especially, and my colleagues as well. Um, Thank but you. If the, um, you're very welcome. Uh, the, the, the premise here is that uh, the workload is uh, growing, and so we need more commissioners. Uh, it's been mentioned already, and I also agree that this could put an additional burden on our existing staff, um, and I agree that that's a strong possibility. We need to address that if that, in fact, occurs. I think it's occurring right now, and yet, as I alluded to the professionalism and hard work of the staff uh, in my initial remarks, that uh, we will have to um, we will have to help, and we should let the governor know that uh, if we do this, that we might need that help. Uh, that should be an alert that goes out if we increase the size of the commission. Um, as you know, my term expired, but I am sitting here today, and I have voted on three issues, and nobody has taken issue with the fact that I have voted on any of those issues. Your term expired. Uh, nobody took issue with the fact that you voted on those issues, and so I don't see why there is any issue with you or I voting on this issue. I'll be voting yes. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Edwards. Uh, well, thank you very much. So, Chair, it, um, you know, you are creating a big hole for us when you are leaving, and you see we need more people uh, to replace you. So I think that that is a credit to your leadership and your hard work. Um, you know, I look at this a little differently. I want to thank Commissioner Berman for that history because I was not aware of that history. Uh, but I will say, you know, a few things. One, when there's a significant change and if there are potentially going to be two new people, one or two. Organizational, uh, organizational design should occur at that time. And if there are going to be any increases, it would be the right time to do that so that we can work together from a structural perspective and not do things piecemeal. Uh, you know, I've only been on the commission for a year. When I went to the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, there is different numbers of people that are on state commissions. Um, one of the challenges that I saw when I came onto the commission is the fact that because we only have five members, it's very difficult for us to stay within the law, but work together on committees. 
which I think increasing the number of commissioners will allow us to do that more. I would love to have committees with our commissioners working on the CLCPA, which is right in front of us, and we need to really work hard on that. I would love to make sure that we are doing everything we can to ensure that we are caring for low-income programs. Um, today, we talked about storm management. I love to work with a fellow commissioner uh, on that work. And then a committee on policy. Uh, I think that this is an opportunity for us to strengthen our work and do it in a way working with the staff. Uh, and I do agree that we need to help the staff uh, as well with this because there are a lot of things that are before, uh, before us. We need to do it right. I think it could help our work, quite frankly. Uh, so I look at this as an opportunity for us to be stronger. You know, there's been some criticism in the past of us taking too long. Uh, this could be an opportunity for us to be more quantitatively quicker, but also qualitatively, and to work together in between sessions on some of these things with the staff. Uh, so I will be supporting this. I think it's a good idea. And I want to thank you, Chair Rhodes. And I do think it's appropriate for you to weigh in uh, because you have that knowledge and you leaving gives us that perspective. So I want to thank you. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for your comments, including uh, the personal note. Thank you very much, Mr. Edwards. Um, Commissioner Howard? I like Commissioner Edwards, who have been on the commission for a little over a year. And some days when I see the volume of material before me, it becomes a little overwhelming. So the concept of a few more hands sharing the work and the responsibility and the interchange of ideas certainly is appropriate. I've also been in government a long time, four decades, and I have seen how it has shrunk in terms of human beings, uh, and technology was the probably biggest driving force of that. Um, however, in various organizations that I have served in or observed, sometimes we ask an organization to do more with less. Well, sometimes you get less with less. And in a period of such dramatic change in how we vision certainly our energy system in this state going forward and decisions that will need to be made in 21 in particular and 22 that will set the course for several decades and potentially hundreds of billions of dollars of new investment. Uh, you know, it is clear now is the time to not only add more commissioners, but clearly I think we should revisit the issue of staffing levels uh, at the commission. Um, and rather than seeing other agencies or affiliated groups grow, particularly with resources that were voted on by this commission, I think it's time that we examine division by division uh, where we know our shortages are. Additionally, we are at a point of great change in the state workforce. What gives me real pause right now is the hundreds of years of institutional knowledge by some very terrific people in our staff, and particularly our senior staff. If they move on, more than just them leaves a bunch of wisdom and insight leads with them. So those transitional issues need to be addressed. And, and, and this is not something unique to the Department of Public Service. I believe it's unique, it is true across the board. 
uh, us baby booners, as we move on to our next part of life, uh, we I don't believe we've had an adequate succession uh, planning, uh, not only at this agency, but across the board. Uh, and I would hope that we would take uh, this opportunity, particularly as we had no leadership to the agency, to examine those issues quickly and try to make uh, what changes will be necessary, probably in this legislative session. Uh, and uh, that is that is my hope, uh, but I will be supporting this resolution. Thank you very much. Um, so with that, we can proceed to a vote on um, on the resolution. Um, for the record, I'm John Rhodes, and my vote is uh, in favor of adopting the resolution. Commissioner Berwin? I vote no. Thank you. Commissioner Alisi? I vote yes. Thank you. Commissioner Edwards? I vote yes. Thank you. Commissioner Howard? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the resolution is adopted. Um, so we will now move to uh, the consent agenda. And uh, I ask, as per usual, do any commissioners wish to comment on or refuse from voting on any items on the consent agenda? I do not. So we begin with uh, Commissioner Berman. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Uh, I can, yes, thank you. Great. I have four items that I will be speaking on. On item 269, this is a draft order adopting with modifications what was proposed in staff's integrated data resource white paper filed May 29th, 2020. I'm voting no. While I think that the proposal for a statewide integrated energy data resource may have some merit, it is not something I think we should undertake as a commission right now at this session. The process set up with the program governance with steering committee and advisory group needs more in-depth discussion among the commission itself on what is appropriate and what guardrails should be in place for proper functioning of the steering committee and advisory group. Frankly, we can and should await until the new permanent chair to decide if this is the direction the new chair and the commission under that chair want to have staff deeply invested in since it will be very time consuming. We, all, we also already put time and energy into the utilities having such data access programs and should instead of focusing on eventually scrapping many of those for the statewide one, we should discuss this in more in depth. <clears throat> it makes no sense to me that we note that several programs have been initiated relating to various aspects of accessing and using energy customer and energy system data, and that we say considering the time needed to implement all the integrated energy data resource capabilities, it will be necessary and reasonable for the utilities to maintain existing data access resources and to continue developing currently planned resource enhancements and additions that would provide stakeholders with earlier access to more data. For me, maybe our focus should be invested more on working with the utilities and other stakeholders on improving what we already have asked of the utilities and the stakeholders and going towards that more. The commission draft order also recognizes that we are considering the establishment of new state policies for a uniform and comprehensive data access framework to govern the means and methods for accessing the protecting all types of energy related information. Thus, the commission is in agreement with the staff that all aspects of implementing and operating the proposed integrated energy data resource must comply with the policies comprising any future new data access framework. The commission also in this draft order agrees with, DPA, with staff's assertion 
that much of this uh, integrated energy data resource value will depend on the extent to which the state energy stakeholders trust the integrated energy data resource as a reliable source of accurate information. Both of those points in terms of waiting for any future new data access framework and how the IE IEDR must comply with those policies out of that framework, as well as ensuring that state energy stakeholders trust the IEDR as a reliable source of accurate information makes sense. It doesn't make sense to me that we're forcing uh, this today, deciding this today, without looking at uh, clearly what our future focus will be on the new data access framework and without working with the stakeholders more on how can we achieve um, optimal um, efficiencies. I am just not comfortable. This is an overly ambitious program, and I am not comfortable with actually uh, seeing that this will be properly executed. We need to make sure that we have the leadership resources and staff capabilities for the long haul to handle the next step. Therefore, I will be voting no on this item. Uh, Commissioner Berman? Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, just a point of, of order. I believe you said you were going to comment on 269. Um, no, I 262. Believe... Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I, I misunderstood. Thank you. Great. I, I'm commenting on four items. Uh, the first was 262. <clears throat> Thank you. Sorry about that. That's okay. The next is item 365. This is a petition by Hudson Valley Clean Energy um, as well as Solar Energy Industries Association, Alliance for Clean Energy in New York, Vote Solar Initiative, National Resources Defense, and the Alliance for uh, Solar Choice, uh, and focused on um, uh, clarifying certain things in our orders. The commission here is denying AES Distributed Energies uh, petition for a two-year extension of the term for retaining a monetary crediting methodology beyond the 25-year term established by the Commission's 2015 transition plan in this proceeding. While I will concur with the draft order, I note that this item is troubling. It shows the extensive engagement the company reports it had during the development stages such that it turned to our staff ombudsman process not once, but seemingly many times and quite extensively. I am genuinely concerned that we, meet, we may need to drill down more in this process and the challenges that are presented there and really understand more from the stakeholders what's going on. I want to be kept more informed of similar issues and how we're working through these to make things better. It's really important to me. I'm going to skip for a moment uh, my third item, which is 371, um, and, and go to 374 and then come back to 371. 374 is um, <clears throat> here the order denies the request in the petition to, one, allow customers to receive credits for multiple community distributed generation projects, two, allow customers to receive credits from both the value of distributed energy resources value stack as well as net metering, and three, determine the 25 kilowatt large customer thresholds in the CDG program by contracted demand or subscription size within a CDG project rather than actual meter demand. However, because utilities were calculating it inconsistently, the guidance in this order is pertaining to the calculation of the 25 kilowatt threshold. Such guidance on the calculation of the 25 kilowatt large customer threshold is intended to create consistency among utilities and lessen investor confusion as our prior orders were unclear. Also, the order allows advanced projects to be grandfathered from the new 25 kilowatt guidance, regardless of whether the threshold was previously based on meter demand, customer size, or classification, or CDG subscription allocation size. I will be concurring with this item, but I am speaking on it because I am concerned about two things that I want to flag. The draft order states that the Commission's longstanding policy is to protect developers with projects in advanced stages of development 
as those projects were developed based on good faith reliance on existing policies. This is an issue for me that we really need to be more careful on and more thoughtful. We just had at our January session an item with Dorogo uh, Power regarding grandfather statuses for value stack compensation. I do think my comments then talking about my concern about how we were handling things and working with developers is something that we really need to take more thoughtfully. When we set forward policies and there is good faith reliance on existing policies, we really do need to understand that it's not just picking a point in this um, and saying, well, they're so, so advanced so they, they'll come under the grandfathering. Others won't. Um, even if they've expended a lot of time and resources. When they work with us on our policies and are trying to comply, and you can see a, a tortured history, it's something we do need to take seriously and figure out what we might be doing wrong in, in that and in our ways that we're handling establishing our policies, especially when we see a continued um, uh, concern about the uh, lack of clarity at times. The second item that I'd also like to address in here is that um, the order states that going forward, the utility shall apply the commission's guidance contained in the body of this order in determining the interpretation of the 25 kilowatt demand threshold. And no project under development may claim a prior but inconsistent utility interpretation after the date of issuance of this order. We state that a six-month transition or other time period is inconsistent with recent commission practice and would increase impacts on non-participating rate payers. I am concerned about that. I'm concerned that um, having it take effect immediately upon um, the date of issuance of this order is something that is uh, concerning to me, um, and I think we should be really carefully looking at that if our practices are appropriate. The next item that I will address is item 371. To be clear, I am a no on this item. <clears throat> I'm going to explain in a moment why. This is an item in the matter of developing a funding mechanism for the electric generation facility sensation mitigation program. This is a really important item, and it's one that I have carefully weighed. I have looked at the history on this as well as um, all the um, filings that were done and the comments that were received, received from the State Energy Planning Board. <clears throat> and I've looked at the law very, very much. Um, here, the State Energy Planning Board, and it's important to understand the historicalness of this, State Energy Planning Board in 2015 set forth a State Energy Plan. It was actually two years late. Every four years, the State Energy Planning Board is to put forward a State Energy Plan. <clears throat> if we go by the 2015 date, 2019 should have been the next State Energy Plan, and then the 2019, the next one would be 2023. <clears throat> the State Energy Planning Board did take the time to issue an amendment to the, the 2015 State Energy Planning Board and they did so in 2020. Now, they did not update the state energy plan to 2019 or to make it a 2020 state energy plan. Part of that was that if they did have to do that, there would be a lot more work that would have been required. And since they felt that the uh, Climate Action Council was working on that, there was no need uh, for them to update the State Energy Planning Board, or at least that's thinking that goes because we haven't really gotten official word on if they're thinking of a 2023 plan, um, what, why they decided not to do a 2019 plan, et cetera. It's important. It's important because we do need to look at how we're following the law and the impact that this may have, especially as it goes to some criticalness um, in terms of our state energy planning. So with that, in, uh, in 2020, there, were, there was an amendment. It actually had two parts to it. One was incorporating um, the uh, goals and the targets uh, and some of the language from the CLCPA into the amendment, into the plan. And then the other was 
uh, the amendment related to the mitigation fund. I'm going to read that in a moment. Here, it, it focused on the language being put into the new state energy, into the uh, 2015 state energy plan, stating New York's electric generation fleet is and will undergo a transition in the coming years as a result of market forces, state policies, and the advent of the CLCPA. In 2016, the Public Service Commission initiated the Clean Energy Standard and adopted the goal of 50% renewable electricity by 2030, which has been increased to 70% through the CLCPA. Also in 2016, Governor Cuomo committed to eliminate all coal generation in New York State by 2020 and followed the adoption of regulations by the Department of Environmental Conservation. The state's remaining coal-fired power plants have announced plans to shut down. In addition to the above policies, nuclear power plant owner Energy announced its intention to close each of the operating units of the Indian Point nuclear power plant by 2020 and 21, respectively. The CLCPA has further committed the state to a zero-carbon electricity sector by 2040. Power plant host communities are able to receive transitional support to alleviate financial losses associated with the generator's retirement through the state's electric generation facility, sensation mitigation program, commonly known as the mitigation program. This mitigation program established in 2015 is expected to see additional demand following the passage of the CLCPA and other policy changes instituted after the mitigation program's initial establishment. Now, this is the important thing that's the directive to us. To account for the changes in energy policy since the onset of the mitigation program, the Public Service Commission will develop a process to consider a mechanism that can provide a stable source of funding for the mitigation program. So I looked at that, looked both, also at all of the comments. Most of the comments from the folks um, in when they were sapped and noticed the state energy plan were really focused on wanting uh, more funding uh, into the mitigation program. Um, they came from uh, school districts. They came from uh, community members. Uh, frankly, mostly uh, in, in the Westchester area and mostly focused on, um, from what I could see, on the closure of Indian Point. So it is obviously a very significant and important aspect for uh, those folks. There also is a recognition that more funding will nece be necessary. Um, there was actually one comment um, that uh, was a little different, and it stated that the amendment should be postponed until the CLCPA final approved scope is available along with the 2020 reliability study. Also at issue is NYSERDA and the New York DEC not releasing the study identified the most rapid, cost-effective, and responsible pathway to reach 100% renewable energy statewide. The Energy Planning Board must analyze and include the study in its decision-making process and the public is entitled to see the study on the basis of New York's Freedom of Information Law. That was one comment that was there. When you go to actually the energy law uh, and you are in energy law uh, 6-104 um, subdivision 4A, I believe, it states the Senate state energy plan shall provide guidance for energy-related decisions to be made by the public and private sectors within the state. Further in the state energy law, Article 6, it also states the state energy board commission or authority may, not must, but may take official notice of the most recent final state energy plan adopted by the board prior to any final energy related decision by such agency, board, commission, or authority. There has been um, a miscommunication in that it is not a mandate that we are taking up everything that is in, in the state energy plan. It is actually something for us to look at as guidance to what we are doing. And to the extent that we are incorporating it, it is very important um, that we do so and that we clearly lay out um, what we are doing. And if we differ from that um, uh, in the state energy plan, that we outline that. 
Now, I am not disputing that the State Energy Planning Board may make amendments to the State Energy Plan. The law is very clear that upon a finding by the board that there has been a material and substantial change in fact or circumstances since the most recent plan was adopted, and then they have certain things that they have to do, they can, as a board, decide to make um, changes and amend the state energy plan. What I am going to say is, and I feel very strongly uh, about, the, uh, about this, is that they do not and they did not have the jurisdiction to direct us to, um, uh, to look at this mitigation fund and direct us to consider a mechanism that can provide a stable source of funding for the mitigation program. That directive does not come from even an incorporation of the CLCPA. Uh, at the time that the CLCPA was uh, adopted and enacted into law, there was already from 2015 legislation specifically related to the mitigation fund. It was done in the budget. Um, and it is something that uh, if the legislature uh, felt was important to change and make us as a commission now having to provide what the stable source of funding for the mitigation program is, they could have done that. They did not. I do not believe that the State Energy Planning Board can act as a mini legislature now and write into in the State Energy Plan an amendment um, focusing on directing us to do something that is clearly for the legislature to decide what should be in that fund or whether they're going to direct us to, to look at that. Um, since there was no legislative directive, since there was no change to that, doing that now, I think, is just not appropriate. Being that what it is, we now need to look at what does this mean? It is very important. We are going to see an increase of access to the funds, especially now with Indian Point. And so it is before us to look at. I believe very strongly that we do not um, have to take this up, nor should we, since the State Energy Planning Board did not have the jurisdiction appropriately to do that. However, for argument's sake, I will go forward, assuming that we're, it, has, it has come before us. It was SAPID. Um, we looked at whether or not uh, what, the, what the appropriate mechanisms may be to provide a stable source of funding for the mitigation program. My concern here goes to the next level. I believe strongly that multiple interveners raises an appropriate and very important point. Multiple interveners notes that it doesn't agree that captive electric customers should be responsible for funding the mitigation program. And multiple interveners stated that the mitigation program is a cost unrelated to the provision of utility service. Nowhere in the draft order does it actually dispute that, that statement by multiple interveners. If we were to now allow this to come to us through a directive from the State Energy Planning Board, we would essentially be opening the floodgates that the State Energy Planning Board can direct us or, frankly, any commission, board, or agency to do something, even if it's not within the scope of their jurisdictional reach, and even if it's not necessarily appropriate for that agency, board, or commission to be looking at. That is also of concern to me since the CLCPA does have where the uh, advisory, uh, the Climate Action Advisory Council will be in uh, 2021 putting forth several recommendations to the State Energy Planning Board for consideration. It actually is teed up very nicely that if we were to follow the law and have now um, as, as proper a new state energy plan in 2023, if we're going from the 2015 uh, marker, then actually it's, the timing can work out very nicely for analysis and deciding how to um, uh, incorporate a lot of that into the state energy plan. However, I remind everyone that the energy law uh, does state that the energy plan is guidance for other agencies and boards to look at and incorporate um, and so it is not necessarily a mandate, but we also do not want to see now 
um, a lot of different directives being issued that really, frankly, will um, uh, look to be getting around what the legislative process should be and what um, a, a commission or board's own independent jurisdiction and processes may have to be as well. Um, I'm sorry, Commissioner Berman, I just... What is appropriate? What we have to do that. Can you hear me now? I hear, me? hear you again now. We lost you for about 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Oh, that was my most brilliant point. <laughs> I'm smiling. All right, in any event, um, I am wrapping up. Uh, as I am concerned when I look at this of the fact that we are now saying that the stable source of funding is to raid uncommitted funds of the ratepayers. Um, we are looking at taking um, $12.5 million per year through 23 to create, and I put in quotes, the stable source of funding for the mitigation program. This will actually go beyond um, the sunset of the law. The law goes to 2025. Now, the draft order does note that and states that, assuming that the law uh, is in place. I don't know why we'd go beyond the sunset um, provision. Again, it seems to me that then we would have a, um, a difficulty in terms of saying, well, we, we should just continue it, even though the legislature didn't, it may have not decided not to um, to uh, re-up this legislation. My concern here is that um, I don't see it appropriate for the stable funding to be taken from uh, uncommitted funds. We have an uh, ongoing proceeding um, uh, on uh, what to do with COVID issues. Um, there's concern that um, you know, in, in this draft order that we're doing that because we understand we don't want to have a new uh, obligation imposed upon uh, rate payers, especially as it is not um, uh, directly from utility service. Totally understand that. I don't understand why we would not be looking carefully at all of the uncommitted funds um, that we have and looking at what we should do holistically. We have a number of proceedings, it seems, that time and time again, we refer to taking money from uncommitted funds of ratepayers um, and that that's better than a new obligation. Yes. However, shouldn't we be looking at all of the different things that are out there, including the um, open COVID proceeding, to decide what is appropriate uh, and have more of a say across the board? Um, my hat's off to Assemblywoman uh, Gillis. Uh, she wants an independent funding stream and more accountability. I totally agree. I totally understand that. But her avenue to make this happen should be through the legislative process. Um, she should not, just as her fellow legislatures, should not want to have um, diluted their legislative power on the mitigation fund um, itself and should really be carefully looking at um, this and weighing in on what is appropriate. Um, I am going to be voting no on this. I feel very strongly that these issues um, and how we are handling them go beyond this mitigation program. We really need to be careful stewards of the ratepayer dollars, and we have an obligation to protect it and to carefully look at what is all um, before us. We will have many issues that will come from the CLCPA that will have um, uh, huge costs attached to them and huge needs for us to uh, refigure out um, how we are doing things. This piecemeal process um, here and this um, subverting uh, uh, the process, the legislative process, is one that I don't feel comfortable with. Um, and what I would say is I would actually, um, especially now, um, as the budget process is ongoing, um, have the legislature look at this 
and decide what they want to do um, to provide a stable source of funding for the mitigation program and weigh in on that. Um, thank you. I'm a no. Thank you very much. Can I just, uh, for good order's sake, Commissioner Berman, confirm that you are a no? on 262 IEDR and a no on 371 mitigation and a concur on 365 AES and on 374 the CDG? Correct. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Lisi, any uh, comments uh, or, or, or questions on the consent, uh, agenda items? Uh, no comments or questions, thank you. Sorry, uh, I, I was on mute. Uh, Commissioner Edwards, any comments or questions on consent agenda items? No, I'm good, Chair Rose. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Commissioner Howard, any comments or questions on consent yes, agenda uh, items? <clears throat> there are two items that I will be commenting on. Uh, one is, first is item C363, running a host benefit uh, program for large-scale renewables. Um, I do appreciate the challenge confronted by staff on implementing this program. How do you identify equitably those residential property owners uh, that are affected or will, could be affected by the impact of large-scale renewables? Um, however, I do believe that this item fails to acknowledge that geography and political boundaries and project boundaries always don't align perfectly. And I believe either currently or in the very new future, we will see property owners who live in adjacent municipalities to the project host who will have border properties that could and probably will uh, be affected in the same criteria that uh, those properties within the host municipality are being treated in this program, uh, particularly visual impacts and the like. Uh, to that extent, I'm pleased that we will take a look back in two years uh, on this program and its implementation. But in the interim, I would urge all municipalities that border host communities uh, for large-scale renewables uh, engage in the siting process uh, to ensure that any potential affected residences receive compensation under this program. Again, I certainly uh, look again to the uh, good work of local governments in protecting their own constituents. With that being said, I will be voting yes. My other item is item 371. I must say I'm very troubled by this item for several reasons. First is the use of Reggie funds uh, to compensate communities for the loss of property tax revenues due to power plant closures. Uh, I submit the use of these funds for this purpose, quite honestly, is inappropriate. Loss of large parcels and the impacts on local property tax base is truly a difficult position for local governments, regardless of the nature of the loss of the type of uh, property that is no longer taxable. However, this item takes one kind of property, in this case power plants, and treats them differently than other large or industrial commercial properties that go off the tax base. The legislature has the power to compensate for the loss of tax revenue through a variety of mechanisms, direct municipal impact aid and larger, and in most uh, communities a much bigger bite, is school aid and the school aid formula, both of which provide a fairer and more sustainable source of funding to the affected municipalities. Also, this takes off any veil from the fact that Reggie and other associated fees uh, 
on emitters or electric and uh, energy uh, rate payers are in effect taxes. That they are not only taxes, but they are fungible and can be used for purposes other than those originally stated when those fees uh, or programs were established. Improving environmental, the environment and moving to a carbon-free economy were the overarching reasons that these funds were created and to provide a um, funding mechanism to get us to those goals. And as we move forward and add additional charges potentially to customers, I must insist that we treat these funds as what they are, taxes, and taxes that should be dedicated to a specific purpose that they were intended and not to be able to plug budget holes uh, in either the state or local uh, coffers. Lastly, this is the perfect example of our state's over-reliance on property taxes to fund essential local service. No state taxes energy infrastructure to the extent that we do in New York. And I suggest that this policy makes it look like major ch that we need major changes in this system and to break the reliance, quote unquote, on hidden taxes in our energy bill. We need to understand that massive new cap, also, we also need to understand that massive new capital investments uh, to meet the goals of the CPA and, and carbon reduction will only exacerbate this very flawed system. Uh, I submit that we do need a very comprehensive approach to real property taxes on our energy and utility systems. Uh, they are unfair. Uh, they come from an era that no longer exists. And uh, I submit that the legislature take this issue very seriously moving forward, particularly as our new investments of hundreds of billions of dollars in new capital could only increase potentially these windfalls or this unfair system. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll be voting no on item 371, and I will be concurring on the balance of the agenda. Thank you very much. Um, with that, uh, uh, may I call for a vote on the consent agenda? Um, I, this is John Rhodes for the record, I am voting yes on the items on the consent agenda. Um, Commissioner Berman, acknowledging your no vote on 262 and 371, how do you vote? I'm going to vote no with uh, John Howard. He convinced me. Um, I think that was uh, important, so I'm going to support his no vote. On 371, but also 262, is that correct? I'm voting no on 262 and 371, and I'm with John Howard on his no vote. His no vote is on 371, is it not? Am I, yep. am I confused? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner Alisi, how do you vote on the consent agenda? Uh, I vote yes. Thank you. I vote. Uh, Commissioner Edwards, how do you vote on the consent agenda? I vote yes. Thank you very much. And Commissioner Howard, um, how do you vote on the consent agenda? I believe you were... A no only on 374, although you made comments on 363. Uh, 371. 371. Excuse me. Yeah, yes, my Mr. Chairman. I, I am a no on 371, and I'm a yes on the balance of the agenda. Thank you very much. With that, uh, the consent agenda. There are There's a question. I also was voting no based on what John Howard said as well, because I thought it was very important. Um, so I see. Okay. Understand. So thank you very much. Um, so uh, with with those votes, the, the consent agenda is approved. Um, and now I ask uh, Secretary Phillips, do we have any uh, other business before we adjourn? Yes, Chair. There is another matter that I would like to address on behalf of staff and the other commissioners. 
Absent objection, there is a resolution that I'd like to read into the record in recognition of the end of your term at the commission and in recognition of your last session. So, whereas John B. Rhodes has served the citizens of the state of New York as the chair of the Public Service Commission and chief executive officer of the Department of Public Service since June 27, 2017, with great distinction, and previously served as President and CEO of the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority from September 2013 to June 2017, and whereas J Chair Rhodes has put his extensive expertise to work for New Yorkers, drawing on more than three decades of experience in business with a focus on the financial and in energy industries and whereas the Commission, under the leadership of Chair Rhodes, has issued over 3,150 orders and guided the Department in the expansion of clean energy initiatives, helping to set the state on a path to achieve its nation-leading energy and climate goals, including authorization of programs designed to achieve 70% renewable electricity by 2013, 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035, 6,000 megawatts of distributed solar by 2015, and 3,000 megawatts of energy storage by 20, 2030. And whereas Chair Rhodes has increased New Yorkers' access to clean distributed energy resources by establishing a compensation system based on the value of pro the projects bring to society and the electronic grid, updates to standardize interconnection requirements to make it easier for distributed generation to connect to the state's electric grid, and implementation of consolidated billing for community distributed generation customers. And whereas the New York State Board on Electric Generation Siting in the Environment, under the leadership of Chair Rose, has granted certificates for 11 large-scale renewable projects totaling over 1,400 megawatts of wind and nearly 200 megawatts of solar, and whereas Chair Rhodes has been recognized for his leadership and commitment to clean energy and energy efficiency, is evidenced by being listed at the top of City and State 2020 Energy and Environmental Power 100 for driving the energy debate and environmental policies in New York, and whereas Chair Rhodes has demonstrated the utmost respect for his colleagues on the commission, the staff of the department, and the utility rate payers of New York State, showing compassion and humility in his leadership, and whereas Chair Rhodes has cultivated a culture of excellence, collegiality, and care in the department by valuing staff and recognizing them for their positive contributions, including through establishing the Take Charge guiding principles initiative and placing emphasis on continuous improvement, employee recognition, and empowerment, it is resolved that the New York State Public Service Commission expresses its deepest appreciation to Chair Rhodes for his leadership of this commission and of the department and his faithful service to the citizens of the state of New York as demonstrated by his unwavering commitment to the mission of the commission to ensure safe, secure and reliable access to electric, gas, steam, telecommunications, and water services for all New York's residential and business customers. That concludes my statement. You're here. Woo. You are now allowed to unmute yourself anytime by pressing star six. Um, I, I've Michelle? Lost Chair Rhodes? Yes. Yeah, yeah, Michelle, can I just, you know, say, and I know other commissioners may speak too, so before you speak, <laughs> Chair Rhodes, I just want to thank you for everything that you have personally done for me over the past year, getting me assimilated into the, the commission. You know, you, your grace and humility and knowledge 
and thoughtfulness is very much appreciated. And your patience is second. So I want to thank all of the team. We will miss you. Thank you. That was Commissioner Edwards for the record. I believe Commissioner Lisi also wanted to make comments. Commissioner Lisi, you may be on mute. There. Yes, I would like to make a few remarks. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, needless to say, it's it's bittersweet because um, I think we will uh, all miss John. That goes without saying, and I think we can all go down the long list of things that he has done, <clears throat> not only for us on the uh, commission and not only for our remarkable staff. Um, I call to your attention his the fact that he's not only the chair of the commission, but also, uh, the CEO of the, of the department with hundreds and hundreds of incredibly talented people. And I have no doubt that each and every one of them look up to John uh, in the role that he has played for them and uh, for all of us and for everybody in New York State because most people, most citizens, probably don't think at all about how all of this gets done. And we know it gets done because of the people that work in the department and on the commission and uh, out in the field, it gets done, but it doesn't get done without leadership. And I can't think of a single person that I have known in my entire life, from all walks of life, that have done their role in whatever it was they were doing as superbly as John Rhodes has done in his role. Um, you know, I, I think of Thomas Edison giving us the light bulb, and that was quite a thing in the day and age. And yet today, um, we have made advancements that make the uh, Edison light bulb obsolete, almost unappreciated, if you can believe that. Um, but you move on. You take a great idea, and you give it to somebody that can deliver it to the future. And we look at all of the things uh, that surround the concept of renewable energy and how we get to a carbon-free future. We have delivered that to a guy like John Rhodes to uh, help us carry it under his leadership into the future so that others will enjoy a better world and more efficient energy, how we light our homes, how we drive our cars, um, how we cook our food and uh, all of that. Um, you know, I was, I was telling my nephew the other day, uh, he was talking about buying an electric car and whether asked me whether he should wait a while and see how things turn out uh, or, you know, will it just be a passing fad? I said, let me tell you about the work that we do on the Public Service Commission and, and, and our a cashed organization, the department. And let me tell you about the man that has given us the guidance over the last few years, and I include his time at NYSERDA, uh, time on the siding board, obviously his chairmanship here. Um, a man with a vision and the willingness to uh, navigate the treacherous waters of how we get to another shore. And treacherous, I mean, not only opposition in the political world, the opposition in the world of business, um, opposition from groups that don't share the view of having uh, a clean environment energized by smart uh, sources of energy. And John Rhodes, I think, is the kind of man that history will remember, just like Thomas Edison. He gave us something, and he gave us the opportunity to take it and move forward with it and improve upon it. Um, I told my nephew that, uh, and think about this world that he's going to inherit 
and all these other young people by the time they're adults. In the year 2050, I said, uh, David, I won't be around, but because of this man I was telling you about, I'm sure I'll be up there smiling down to see how the world turned out for you. Uh, My nephew said, Uncle Jimmy, I think it's more likely that you'll be looking up. But in any event, we will have that because of John Rhodes. And John, uh, I want you to know that I will be looking up. I will always look up to you, and I will always be grateful for your friendship and your leadership. Commissioner Berman. Thank you. Um, Chair, I will miss you. Um, You've been a very um, good chair. Um, I've enjoyed um, our um, uh, relationship, and um, I look fondly upon um, the time that we've spent together, um, including our 10-hour ride to Virginia um, together. Um, It is Thomas Edison's birthday, um, and so I'll just leave you with a quote, which is, the three great essentials to achieve anything worthwhile are hard work, stick to his myth, and common sense. You embody all of that, and um, I look forward to uh, your future endeavors and working again with you. Thank you. And Commissioner Howard? Yes, uh, John, uh, you have taken, as many of us had, the role of public service to its highest plateau, uh, which is different than being a legislature and different than being an executive, but you are also a regulator, where you, by definition, your job is to take a variety of inputs make fair decisions and be just and reasonable for the people of the state of New York. And to that end, I think you fulfilled your role magnificently. Uh, Best of luck in the future. And uh, I hope you're available on the phone for guidance as I need it. Thank you very much and we will miss you. And Chair Rhodes, this is Secretary Phillips. I just personally want to say thank you as well and give you the opportunity to comment. You have to unmute yourself. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, I was only unmuted in one one insufficient place. Um, so thank you very much, um, all of you, for uh, the very kind and thoughtful, thoughtful words. I'm not really sure uh, how to respond um, to, much of, to much of what was said, um, but I will embrace um, the words that noticed uh, that took note of our accomplishments um, as long as one, we recognize that we did it together, and two, that we recognize um, that there's more to come. Um, you know, Diane mentioned uh, a three part recipe uh, she attributed to, to uh, Thomas Edison. I have my own magic three-part recipe. It's not mine. I'm borrowing it from other people, but it's the one I believe in. My own three-part magic recipe, which is that um, good, meaningful work happens when you've got terrific colleagues, one, who want to work together, two, on important stuff, three. Um, And uh, you provided that in spades. Um, So um, that's the foundation for everything that we've done together. Um, Let's stay on this mission. Uh, Let's stay in this fight. 
And thanks in advance to all of you for doing that. Um, thanks for these uh, really appreciated remarks today. And thank you for your years of work and colleagueship. Um, it means the world to me. Thank you. So perhaps on that note, shall I adjourn? We are adjourned. Thank you very much, all, uh, all, all my colleagues. Okay, we're off the record. <laughs>